When the heart is failing, when it's no longer working as well as it should, um, we have great medicines uh, to uh, help deal with that, to help deal with the symptoms, uh, to help deal with the, the problems that people have when they develop heart failure. But at some point, uh, the heart stops working and uh, the, all the medicines that we normally give uh, aren't effective anymore. So what do we do at that point? And the answer to that is heart transplantation. We take uh, a heart from an uh, individual who has passed away and we give that heart to a person whose heart is failing. And in that way, we can give them more precious time with their families. Uh, and lead to a longer life for those people. Uh, there are about 3,000 heart transplants uh, that are performed um, in the world uh, each year. Uh, there are many, many more people who are awaiting heart transplant than there are hearts that are available. So as a part of an evaluation uh, for heart transplant, we need to make sure that the appropriate donor heart fits the recipient. And there are a number of things that go into matching that. And one of those things is size. So for instance, if you had a person who was four foot 11 um, who needed a heart, you couldn't then take a donor heart from someone who is 6'3 and 270 pounds because the heart simply wouldn't fit. So size is one of those things that does matter. In addition, other things uh, that matter in terms of when a heart transplant uh, can be done uh, is the blood type of the person. You have to uh, have a match in terms of blood type. You also, uh, uh, it depends on how sick they are. And so it is the sicker patients who are more likely to be transplanted and to wait uh, less time than those patients who are less sick. Heart transplant is going to be the treatment of choice for end stage heart failure. And uh, there are many conditions uh, that can lead to end stage heart failure. Uh, one of the most common ones is having disease in the arteries of the heart. Therefore, those patients who have had heart attacks in the past, who have had bypass surgery, who have had stents placed in, they can go on to develop end-stage heart failure. And in that case, then transplant would be uh, a viable option. There are also other conditions that cause end-stage heart failure. These include genetic conditions or things that run in the family. Um, there are uh, rheumatologic conditions uh, such as sarcoid or infiltrative diseases like amyloid. And sometimes we're unable to tell exactly what the condition is that can lead to end stage heart failure. In any case, the treatment of choice, however, is going to be heart transplant. One of the other uh, causes of end stage heart failure are drugs. Uh, so drugs can be toxic to the heart and they include chemotherapeutic agents that people have, uh, may have needed to uh, have uh, because they've had a malignancy in the past. So these things can lead over time to end stage heart failure. So there are many excellent medications that we use for the treatment of heart failure. However, people still can develop end stage heart failure despite our best interventions. How do we know when it's time to refer someone to heart transplant. When we're giving our best medications and they stop working, or when we're giving our best medications and people no longer tolerate those medicines. Uh, when a month ago, uh, the patient says that they're you know, able to walk a football field and now they're still on the best medicines that we can give them. They're only able to walk a block or to the end of the bed without becoming short of breath. It's at that time when we start considering whether or not heart transplant is the right thing for that patient. When patients are no longer tolerating our best therapies, there are advanced therapies that we talk about. 
One of those therapies is IV medication that, can, that people can use to make the heart stronger. This medicine, however, is thought to be temporary because we know that when patients are on this medicine for a long period of time, that um, within six months to uh, 12 months, they will pass away. So it's usually used as a temporizing measure. Another uh, potential option is a heart pump, or what we call a VAD, or a ventricular assist device. With this uh, pump that is used to assist the left ventricle, which is usually the major pumping chamber that is having a hard time in heart failure, patients can um, live longer and uh, do better in terms of, uh, of, of their heart failure. However, um, we still know that heart transplant is the treatment of choice because we know that patients live longer with heart transplant than they do with ventricular assist devices or VATs. So there are four stages of heart failure. And once you reach that last stage, the fourth stage, or what we call stage D heart failure, the mortality in one year for someone who has true stage D heart failure is anywhere from 50 to 70%. Therefore, it makes sense that we used advanced therapies to help those patients. And with transplant, we can turn the 50 to 70% mortality that the person will have to a 90% survival post-transplant. And that's why we do what we do. That is the importance of uh, potentially transplanting as many patients as possible to give them that life expectancy, to give them that time. When we embark on an evaluation for heart transplant, we ask two major questions. One is, can we help this patient? Can we change their quality of life? Can we make their life longer? And two, is there anything about this patient that would make heart transplant too risky for the patient? And that's the reason we do the evaluation. And we break the evaluation into three different parts. You know, part one is the financial part. Um, is there a way uh, for us to, you know, financially get this person through heart transplant. And usually that's not really that big of a consideration. And that's why we have insurance. And for those who don't, we have a way of trying to get them insurance so that finances are not usually anything that limit a patient's ability to get a heart transplant. The second is medical issues. Are there any medical issues that make heart transplant too risky in this person? And one of those medical issues that I give as an example is if we're doing an evaluation for a heart transplant and it turns out that someone has cancer, then that's probably not the right person. So they go through a medical part of the evaluation as well to make sure that there isn't anything else uh, that would preclude them from having a heart transplant. And the third is the psychosocial piece. You know, it, we have a societal responsibility for such a um, scarce uh, resource as a heart transplant. And so we want to make sure that we give it to the right person to make sure that they're the, the right candidate for a heart transplant. And one of the things that we look at is, is this person going to be compliant? Are they going to go uh, to their clinic visits, and there are a lot of clinic visits, at least initially. Are they going to take their medications? Because if they don't take their medications, then they can risk losing the, the, the donor heart that we give them. So all of those things make up the evaluation in determining who is going to be the right candidate uh, for heart transplant. The, the procedure itself uh, usually uh, takes about four hours and um, the uh, donor heart uh, is brought to the operating room uh, with 
the recipient. And um, the recipient's heart is taken out and the donor heart is placed in. And that sounds very simple um, in terms of an explanation for what happens during uh, the heart transplant. But around uh, all of this includes the support for the person who's receiving the heart, making sure that, that they have blood going to the other organs. And it's usually the heart that supplies that blood. And so they have to be on bypass machines in order to make sure the other organs are okay while they're working on the heart. But simply, um, that, that is how it's done. The bulk of the work, other than what's done during the surgery, actually takes place afterwards. How do we make sure that this heart is still well taken care of? What are the potential pitfalls? And then how do we avoid those pitfalls after the transplant is done? When a donor heart is placed uh, into a recipient, the recipient sees that heart as foreign. And so the body wants to attack that organ. We therefore have to give medications that suppress the immune system because it is the immune system that leads to the attack on something that it sees as foreign. And so what we do is we give immunosuppressive drugs. And uh, those drugs will help to prevent rejection of the organ. Uh, and that's one of the things that it's most important uh, to, uh, to do after an operation. But the problem with immunosuppressive drugs is that they can increase the risk of infection. So one of the most important things that we watch after heart transplant is the risk of rejection and the risk of infection. And so those are some of the common pitfalls that you see particularly in the first year after transplant. Patients take immunosuppressive uh, medications for the rest of their, of their lives. Uh, initially, when the risk of rejection is highest, they're on a higher dose of those medicines. But as time goes on, uh, the risk of rejection gets lower and we can lower the immunosuppressive drugs and therefore lower the chance of patients becoming infected uh, because of the immunosuppression. The one year survival uh, after heart transplant is about 92% uh, worldwide. We would love for it to be 100%, but you have to remember that these are the, the folks who, whose one-year mortality was 50 to 70% because their hearts were so sick. If you survive uh, that first year, and again, 92% of our patients survive that first year, then the average number of years that you live after that is about 13 and a half. And remember, this is all comers, right? So we have some patients in our program who have lived with the same heart for about 30 years. But on average, the median life expectancy is going to be about 13 and a half years after heart transplant. In the short term, post-transplant, you've just had a major heart surgery. And so the recovery, uh, uh, tends to be a little bit longer. Generally speaking, uh, patients are out of the hospital uh, in about 16 days or so. Generally speaking, they're able to go home, but some people need to have rehab and go to a rehab facility prior to going home. The interface that occurs with the team is pretty robust. Uh, we see patients every two weeks for uh, the first three months, and then after that every month. And then after the first two years, we get to see them uh, two times a year. And so this, at least initially, is a very intense process. Uh, intense in terms of the surgical procedure itself and the rehab from the procedure, 
but also in terms of how closely we follow you. And I think that's only to the benefit of the patient. The thing that's most important is the early referral into the program. When patients become too sick, then it's harder to get that evaluation done and get to a point where we can get them transplanted. Um, there are 10 to 14,000 patients who are awaiting a heart transplant and not enough hearts uh, to give to all of those patients. And so it's important that patients come to us early, that we can follow them closely so that we know when to list them and when to put them in the best position so that they can, if they are a good candidate, become listed for heart transplant. When we get the early referral, we have the time. When the referral is late, we may run out of time. So it's important that if the patient is failing the medical therapy, uh, if the patient is getting sicker, if the patient has been hospitalized more than once or twice in a year, that's the time to get the patients to us because that is the time that we know that you know, success is attainable in getting them to transplant. In terms of uh, the, the transplant itself and what makes a successful transplant, I think that that ties into what makes Penn a successful transplant program. And that is the multidisciplinary team that's involved. When you come into our program, you meet subspecialists from 10 to 12 different areas, depending on who you are, who help to take care of you, who help to maintain you. And sometimes you don't end up even needing a heart transplant because you have such good care of the people who are taking care of you. But for those who do, we keep them uh, well and keep them well enough uh, so that when it's their time to be transplanted, uh, it's a much more successful transplant because their kidneys are okay, because they don't have any infectious disease complications, because their diabetes is under control, because they're taken care of by a multidisciplinary team and program. Referrals to the transplant program can occur in a number of ways. Usually, uh, an internist or a cardiologist who's been taking care of a patient in the community who has been trying all of the guideline uh, medical therapy that uh, the American Heart Association, the American Car uh, College of Cardiology suggests, they've been doing all the right things and the patient is still failing. So for the most part, most of our referrals come from local cardiologists or internal medicine doctors. Occasionally, um, there will be transfers from outside hospital uh, of a patient who is very, very ill. And we can get inpatient uh, evaluations done in anywhere from three to five days for those patients who are most sick. So occasionally, we'll have a referral that way. Penn tends to be a relatively high-risk program, and therefore, other programs may say no, and then the program itself would refer to Penn's heart transplant program to take another look at the patient. And then lastly, there is a self-referral. When the patient wants a second opinion, uh, sometimes we'll have patients come in uh, uh, to our transplant program for a second opinion, about either advanced heart failure therapies or about transplant. You know, once rehab is over, uh, then patients start to go back to what's normal for them. Uh, there are patients that we have transplanted uh, who uh, prior to transplant were triathletes and went back to uh, competing in um, uh, in, in triathlons. That is unique. Uh, however, uh, patients, generally speaking, are well enough to go back to their normal lives. 
most of those patients um, by year two are back to work if they wish to be. Um, they can do most, if not all, of the things that they could do prior to transplant. The answer to how long someone waits for an organ is it depends. And the factor that's most important is how sick the patient is. Those patients who are sicker get transplanted sooner. Those patients who are in the hospital and perhaps on support with devices um, are going to be the ones who get transplanted first because they are sicker. This is as opposed to a person who is sick but who is at home waiting for, tra uh, for transplant. Additionally, the blood type of the patient matters and the size of the patient uh, matters. And I'll be dating myself a little bit, but you know, you can't put Andre the Giant's heart into someone who's my size, for example. So um, you have to wait for the right size, you have to wait for the right blood type, and, um, and it depends on how sick you are. So the wait can be as short as two days for someone who is incredibly ill in the hospital and can be as long as years for someone who is not as sick, uh, who is waiting at home. So UNOS is the organization that helps us figure out how to share the organs that become available. And the country is divided up into regions. And so for example, Penn would be in the same donor region as all of the other centers that are within 500 miles of Penn. So if a donor becomes available, then uh, UNOS would help figure out which um, institution the organ goes to based on how long people are waiting, how sick they are, um, uh, and where they are on the list, uh, on the waiting list. What limits heart transplant in particular is we know that if the time outside of the body of the heart is longer than four hours, that the heart won't work as well. So for example, we couldn't take a heart from California and bring it to Philadelphia because the time would be too long. And so there is a geographic uh, limit to how far one can go uh, to get a heart transplant. Once a heart transplant, for example, would be a donor would be available in, for example, New Jersey, then the centers would get together and figure out how to get that heart from New Jersey to uh, 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 Pennsylvania. And for the most part, it's usually a helicopter flight or sometimes an airplane flight in order to get the donor heart to the center that was going to transplant. Most insurances uh, cover a heart transplant. There are limits, however, and sometimes people have state insurance that would only cover in that state, and therefore you can't cross the lines of the state. Um, most people do have adequate coverage, and if they don't have adequate coverage, one of the special things about our program is that we have social workers and financial advisors that are dedicated to the program that can help people get what they need in order to be good transplant candidates. And maybe not necessarily good transplant candidates at Penn, but help them find a center where they can be helped. Because Yes, we want to transplant as many patients as possible, but our focus is the patient, is you, and what we can do to get you what you need. And sometimes that can be at Penn, and sometimes it needs to be somewhere else, but either way, that's what we do when we use our social workers and our financial advisors appropriately. I love talking about Penn, and I 
am proud to talk about the program at Penn because I do think it's wonderful. And I think that there are three main ways in which it distinguishes itself from other programs. The first is the clinical expertise. There are many conditions that can lead to end-stage heart failure that may require heart transplant. And Penn has experts in all of them. So it is the clinical expertise. It is the expertise that we have in genetic cardiomyopathies, the expertise that we have in amyloid disease, that we have in sarcoid disease, that we have in drug-induced, as in chemotherapy-induced uh, heart failure. Those experts all exist at Penn and are able to be a part of our approach in terms of heart transplant. Another part of that is that we offer dual heart transplants, unlike other centers. Patients who have kidney disease or who have lung disease or who have liver disease, we uh, perform heart kidney, we perform heart lung, and we perform heart liver transplants for those patients. The second pillar, uh, I believe, is our personalized care. We believe that the patient is the center and that we are the spokes of the wheel uh, taking care of that patient. Um, we uh, believe it is this multidisciplinary approach um, that brings the patient through the process, the pre-transplant process, during the transplant, and then after the transplant and ensures their safety in all of those spaces. We work with the patient uh, in terms of any financial needs uh, that they may have. We work with the referring physician who's been taking care of that patient for years so that relationship is not excluded, but we consider our referrings collaborators so that they continue to take care of uh, 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 our patients as we continue to take care of them as well. We also offer things that make uh, the whole transplant process uh, much more efficient uh, and um, uh, available for the patient. For example, if someone's coming from far away, they can get a lot of their testing locally. And uh, we're now able to share you know, things like uh, echocardiograms and CT scans, you know, via machines so they don't have to be here. At times, we're able to do telemedicine visits uh, so that uh, for those people who are far away, they are not uh, as inconvenienced uh, by this. And I think that the last pillar uh, that distinguishes us is our world-class uh, uh, status uh, uh, in terms of research and innovation. Uh, if it's you know, using hepatitis uh, C positive donors uh, to figure out biomarkers that we can use to see if someone's rejecting our heart um, or if someone's developing an infection or the research that we do to help figure out who's gonna be the perfect candidate and how, or how we are going to match that candidate uh, uh, to uh, the right donor. All of these things uh, that we do in terms of re research, I think, helps distinguish uh, Penn. And I'm proud to be the medical director of the program.